first and foremost, um, me being me, I know I have people that you know love me very, very, very much, and I know I have people that hate me very, very, very much. Um, my personality is not one that lends itself to comments like, he's okay, yeah, bring him to the party, it's okay. <laughs> it's either, you know, we gotta have him at the party or keep him as far away from the party as possible. <laughs> but, and I'm not saying this to compare, I fall so short of the glory every day, I'm embarrassed. But when you look at the Gospels, and you read about Yeshua's persona, there were literally people who would give him their life, and then there were people who wanted to take his life, and there wasn't much in between. I'm just thinking that the more you try to be like him, you know, these opinions that we have about the Bible, they are so anti our society today. Uh, just incredibly so, to where people that are my age, um, your age, we scratch our head. We just, we can't, we didn't exactly see this coming. We just thought, you know, things were going to kind of get a little bad and then, you know, the seals were going to break and then your shoe was going to show up and fix it. Um, and for some of us who, you know, love this country and love the Lord, and love Yeshua, and love our families, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's not, you know, I think it's way past angry. It's heart-wrenching, yeah. gut-wrenching. Yeah. It's painful. Yeah. And I'm not exaggerating one iota. Um, I just want to show you two quick pics. Um, the book in Spanish is coming out. Funny, the first mission I ever went on like 30 years ago was in um, Nicaragua. And um, boy, I tried to speak Spanish and it was, it was bad. I was with a friend of mine who was one of three evangelists for the Holy Assemblies of God. They're 250 million strong. And they have three evangelists at any one time that goes around the world. Um, and we became best friends, and he was as crazy as I am, but just a little less. He was born in Costa Rica, so he was fluent, and he told me, um, he told me, you gotta stop, you gotta stop speaking Spanish. <laughs> because there was one point we were in this church, there was no windows to the church, and um, poor area, I mean, I won't tell you how poor, what, what was incredibly poor. And the church was full. It was a very weird thing. I feel, I feel like I'm almost back there. You know, things have gotten too sanitized in America. And I got too sanitized. I got too pretty and too sterile. And too, this is what the word says. There's, a, there's an aspect of the Holy Spirit that, that you absolutely need in your life that is so powerful. That anointing of the Holy Spirit can stop the devil in his tracks. That anointing of the Holy Spirit can heal and deliver. I, I just think we lost that element a little bit in America. I think some people took it to an extreme and it got silly. So the mainline denominations put on the brakes. So now it's, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Bible. Now I love the Bible, but it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And just because people got silly with it, that doesn't mean we have to, you know, deny it or shelve it. Um, but I was praying over people, like for the, I was a new believer, and people were falling down, but legit falling down. Nobody was catching them. I didn't know what was going on. I never saw it. I never saw that. People getting healed, it was crazy. It was crazy. It was like they had some delegation that was waiting for a Jew to come to Nicaragua. This is what they told me. I was like, this is crazy, but I was crazy back then. I was crazy, I didn't know so much. And sometimes when you don't know so much, you could be really crazy in the spirit. 
So there was a bunch of pastors sitting there, and I tried to say, your nose is a testimony. <laughs> because, because what I was trying to say is, seriously, there was like a purple vapor in the church. I don't know how to explain it. There was, there was a presence of God there, a manifest presence of God in the church. And there was a smell, there was a scent, there was a perfume. It was a perfume. I'm, I'm not making this up, guys. You know me by now. I'm here 20 years. Uh, I don't make stuff up. And, and I tried to say Sunaris because I knew from, from like junior high school Spanish. So I meant to say Sunaris es un testigo. Your nose is a testimony. But I said Sunaris es un testigulo, which your nose is a testicle. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. The pastors in the front went like this. They all grabbed their nose. Because they had such a respect for me, they were wondering, is my nose a testicle? Is that what God just did? And that's when my friend said, you st stop, no more Spanish the rest of the time. So the book was written by an expert in Spanish translation. I did not write it. Ma'am, lighten up, okay? Seriously, lighten up. This is going to be a heavy subject, something that you're not going to be able to handle. So I have to start light. I have to. This is, this is as heavy as it comes. You know, and if you didn't see, let, forget 20 years of preaching. Forget 1,000 messages. 1,000 messages. Forget them all. Make sure you watch last week's Israel Matters. Yes. The history of the Palestinian people, the history of Palestine, the history of Israel. It's just chapter verse. Make sure you watch it. Make sure you watch it. You must be informed with what's going on. You have to, because you have to be able to communicate that. Yes. One of the churches that called me, they said, we need to know. It was a nice Presbyterian church. We need to know. I said, watch that. Watch today. Hopefully he's watching. And I said, between those two, you'll be able to teach it. Right. I don't, I don't want to run around teaching. You should be able to teach this. Right. I know last week what happened was, last week you left and you go, look, I don't know exactly what he said, but Israel matters. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. You can't just say to somebody, Israel matters. Why? It, they just do. Read the Bible. Why? Because it's the Word of God. How do you know? It just is. Stop. Set apart Messiah as Lord and always give a defense for the hope that is in you. Where did apologetics go? How dare the Jehovah Witness be more apologetic than us? Study. Watch it a few times. Write down some scriptures. Look at the scriptures. Look at the word study. She'll be semi-informed so you can share this. Not, hey, you got to listen to my rabbi. No. No, this could be my last day. Then what? Got to listen to you. You're, you're the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. Just so you know, I've always told you chapters and verses weren't in the Bible. That's not the way it was dictated by God. Okay. It happened around 1227, just for your edification, an Archbishop of Canterbury, his name was Stephen Langton, started to put in chapters. Some of the chapters he put in were good spots, some maybe not the best, okay? And then Wycliffe was the first English Bible, 1382. They went along with the chapter pattern. And then a guy, Robert Estine, used verses in 1555. Why did they do this? So that we can teach, so that we can reference. It's much easier to say John 3.16 than God so loved. Right. Or if I go the war of Magog and Gog, as opposed to Ezekiel 38.39. Just for teaching purposes, there was nothing wrong with it. Everything right about it. So the first scripture we're going to put up is Matthew 24.3. Matthew 24, what, what corresponds in the, go the, go the gospel is a synoptic. It means Greek for the same eyes. So there's three synoptic gospels, and then John is the universal gospel for all people. So you got Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew 24 is all about the end days. Where do we find that in Mark? What chapter? Anybody know? What about Luke? What chapter? You don't know. It's okay. You should know. You should know. Because... This is where Yeshua explains what's going to happen, the signs of his return and the signs of the Olam Hazeh, the end of the age. You should know. Those chapters are really important. Daniel gives the timing. He talks about weeks of years. He gives the timing of those last days. 
and then Revelation gives details. You got to be a little careful with Revelation. Revelation has a lot of metaphor and a lot of simile. All you have to do is make sure there's a precedent for that. Meaning, just don't jump on the bandwagon of somebody teaching. Find out where else these terms and these numbers are used in the Bible. Connect the dots. Okay? But Matthew is, the first time I read it, it grabbed a hold of me, Matthew 24. It grabbed me. I'm not kidding you. And it never, ever let me go. Never. So, he just gave these woes. It, it, this is like his last will and testament. Matthew 23, he, he cries over his people. He says, I came to you as a shepherd who wanted to gather her sheep, but you were unwilling. Your house is going to be left to you desolate. He really laced into the religious men of his time. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, he laces into them. And then he goes off to the Mount of Olives. And he was sitting there on the Mount of Olives because it's his go-to place. You know Israel. It's right there. The East Gate is right there. Take a few steps. There's the Garden of Gethsemane. Take a few more steps. There's the Mount of Olives. It's small. It's a small place. And that was his go-to place. Some people like parks. Some people like beaches. Some people like a room in their house. This was his spot. So he went there. And he's on the Mount of Olives. And his Talmudin, those his disciples, they came to him privately. They said, tell us, they said, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that you are coming at the Olam Hazeh? The end, this, this world, this age is ending. So they basically ask him three questions. The first one, when will these things happen? Because the first two verses, he said, they said, look at these beautiful buildings. He said, they're going to topple down. So he prophesies, when is this going to happen? That was 70, right? Titus came in under the emperor of Rome, and he leveled Jerusalem, right? That happened. And then they ask him, when will be the sign of you coming? And the Olam has an ending, which is essentially the same question. How are we going to know you're coming? They thought he was going to come back in a week. You can't blame them. It was wishful thinking. They wanted him back too, just like we do. Yes. Now, does he say it's not for you to know the time or the seasons? No. Forget chapter and verse for a minute. He gives 97 sentences. You know, Yeshua didn't say that much. And I'm not being derogatory. Our, our, our Bible is small, and the Gospels are smaller, and the Synoptic Gospels are smaller, and the red letters are small. Maybe 800 sentences. So almost 100 sentences he get, he's going to answer. That's like 12, 14% of everything he said. Think about that. So this must be really important. And some of us want to know, right? We say, what, what's, the, what's the signs? Are there signs? I'm not making this up. People have their own philosophies, their own ideologies. Don't ever ask me what I think, because I don't. I just... I just want to know what he said. It's a legitimate question. If he was here right now, Yeshua, what's the sign that you're going to really like come back and set things straight? So I'm going to give you a few points. Some of them you might agree with. Some of them you might not agree with. Some of them you might have additional points to add. It's okay. This is just what I see happening today. Number one. The first thing he says out of the gate, look at Matthew 24, 4 through 5. He speaks about deception. The very first thing he says, he doesn't talk about earthquakes, famines, doesn't talk about the abomination of desolation, doesn't talk about seals and trumpets and bowls. Right out of the gate, he says, don't be deceived. And then at the end of his speech, he says, you better be ready. So I think those are, you know, your beginning and your end is important. So that's a message for us. Don't be deceived. Even the elect can be deceived. Don't put that snide look on your face like you know so much. Because it's people that don't think they can be deceived that are usually the first ones deceived. The devil wants to get at you. And if you don't think you can be deceived, you're already deceived. Because deception is so deceiving in order for it to accomplish its goal to deceive. And then he says at the end, even if you don't understand the seals, and I'm not going to get into that, not today. And the bowls and the abomination of desolation, even if you don't know what that means, you better be ready for his return. He says, Yeshua replies, first thing, watch out. Now, that, I'm saying that because there's an exclamation point now because I like to yell. Don't let anyone fool you. Listen to what he's saying. 
These are the disciples. These are the guys who lived with them for three years. They were so close to him. They hung out with him every day. We just read his words in the midst of all the other crap that we do. That usually is more important on our priority list. Some of us don't even read his words anymore. Some of us hasn't read his word in a month. And to his disciples, the closest one to him, the ones that had it undiluted, non-polluted, straight from the source, right from the horse's mouth, he says, don't let anybody fool you. What does that mean? Deception is coming. As soon as he splits, all the deceivers are coming out. Who is the, de what's the devil's name? The deceiver, not a deceiver. There's tons of deceivers. The deceiver of the brethren. The Bible says he comes as an angel of light. He doesn't come at you with a red suit and a pitchfork and says, worship me. Nobody would buy that. He's insidious and he's brilliant. Guys, when God created the angels, he was the number one. He was the numero uno angel. All the other angels reported to him. You're not dealing with some. When you say, ah, I got this. You know what? If you, let me know when you're going to say that so I can step away from you. <laughs> For many will come, not a few, in my name, saying I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. He's predicting that many are going to be led astray. What you're seeing today, he predicted. Yes. Of course it's going to happen. Deception is very scary to yours truly. If you get nothing else out of this. As we move closer and closer towards the last days, when did the end days start? People think they started last week, they started with Obama, whatever. When did the last day start? When he left. First John 2.18, that's when the end day started. It wasn't a countdown to a takeoff, it was a count up to a touchdown. We would count up to a certain time when he would touch down. That's when they started. Make no mistake, biblically speaking. They didn't start last week. This thing did just creep up on us. But as we move closer and closer, as we keep counting, another Shabbat, another Shabbat, another month, another year, Yeshua said there would be an increasing danger of deception by false teachers. I'm a teacher. You got to, you, am I false? You, you got to check with what I say with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. I never told you to take what I say as the gospel. I always told you, give me one ear. I always told you, check it out with the Bible. Check it out with the Holy Spirit. If I need to be rebuked, rebuke me. There is a current rise in cults today. You might not be aware of this. But there's a current rise as more and more people are searching for leaders to deliver them. They are desperate. And they're seeking leaders who claim to have secret. Stop watching these idiots on TV and the internet who have the mysteries. I just watched somebody sent me. I watched for 30 minutes. This guy talk about all the mysteries. The mystery was there was no mysteries. The, my the mystery to me was why are people listening to him? Because he's selling crap. Everybody wants to unlock the mysteries. What's the mystery? There is liberal Protestantism. There is liberal Catholicism. There is universalism. There is Russellism, a.k.a. the Jehovah Witnesses. There is Mormonism. There's Christian science. There's the unity school of Christianity. There's Christadelphianism and Armstrongism, and that's just naming a few. There is nothing new about deception and false teachers, as we were warned by Paul about Gnosticism in Colossians 2. You've heard of Gnosticism? You can read about it in Colossians 2. They don't tell you what it is. But Gnosticism is the belief that the body is inherently sinful, therefore they practice self-denial or self-torture. Or they go the other extreme, the body has no effect on a person's spiritual life, so they practice carnal indulgence. That's Gnosticism. 
We were warned about false teachers by John. These are greats. Paul, John, in Revelation 2, what did he teach about? Stay away from the teaching of the Nicolaitans, not shins, tins, Nicolaitans. What did they teach? They taught that spiritual liberty gave sufficient leeway to practice idolatry and immorality. Now you read stay away from that, but if you've never looked it up, it, what the word means is to ruin the people of God. And we were warned by Peter. These are like John, I'm giving you John, Peter, and Paul. These are giants of the faith. He talked a whole chapter. Please, if you have nothing better to do, go home and read 2 Peter chapter 2 about false teachers. This is what breaks my heart. I, I don't think I'm, I, I, look, man, I don't know how many times I, I got to tell you this. I don't consider myself a rabbi. I don't tell anybody I'm a rabbi. I don't consider myself a pastor. Ask my wife, ask my kids if I ever told anybody that. When people ask me what do I do if they should do that if I'm on vacation, I say I'm in the restoration business. They say, what, aluminum, glass, souls. I tell them I go to places that are needy and help them out. They say, are you a pastor? I go, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm just a guy who loves his heavenly father. I have no need to tell them that. Why? I have no need to bring them here. I've never invited one of you here, have I? Uh-uh, you didn't get my invite. The Holy Spirit will bring who he wants, and the Holy Spirit will take out who he shall take out. That's his department. Our baskets are overflowing from people who will never come in here. I'm not going to beg. I'm not going to put up stuff to, no. No, I'm not going to do it. Sadly enough, though, false teachers are taking their place inside the church. Inside the church. Why do you think we have cameras everywhere? Why do you think we have security everywhere? Why do you think we have gunmen everywhere? Why do you think we don't let the kids go to the bathroom themselves? Pedophiles love to hang out in a church. Churches are desperate. They'll take anyone. Pastors of major denominations are currently leaving sound doctrine as we speak. They deny things like the Verbal, absolute inspiration of the Bible. They deny things like the Trinity. They deny things like the deity of Messiah. They deny the virgin birth. They deny that his death is a substitute for sinners. And they're packing the house. They are especially vehement in their denial of the value of his shed blood. They deny his bodily resurrection. They deny eternal punishment. They deny salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Yeshua. Major denominations. Major. And let us not forget that Satan is the deceiver of the brethren. Listen to me. Please. I never tell you listen to me, right? Never. I'm, I'm, this is my heart today. The devil is never more satanic than when he carries a Bible. Twist one word. Iniquity means avon in Hebrew. It's to twist. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was, let's just insert an A. A God. Just one letter, and we'll change Yeshua's whole persona. One letter changed everything. This is a trend today as the spirit of deception is taking hold of our culture. 2 Timothy 4, 3, 4 says this, for the time is coming, this was said 2,000 years ago, when people will not have patience for sound teaching. They want water slides. They want a, cru they want a cruise. Let's put, I know a, a church, two and a half million dollars into this children's program, not in teaching, playground. There's enough playgrounds, right? Take them to Chick-fil-A. The people are nice there. It's clean. Now let them go down a the slide. They got enough gadgets. They got enough toys. They don't need to play in the church. They need to learn, man. They need to learn the book of Leviticus. 
You ask an average adult in the church, what's Leviticus? They think it's some skin disease that they got to see a dermatologist for. Oh, I think I had a Leviticus once, <laughs> but it went away. They will cater to their passions. Well, what I think, well, what I want, oh, I'm sorry. Did, did anybody ask you? Well, what our family's looking for, I'll tell you what my family's looking for. We're looking for God. Is he at your place? We'll hang out with you. We're looking for God, man. I don't need coffee. I have coffee at home. It's better coffee than the crap they serve here. They'll gather around for their passions themselves, teachers. Teachers, it's all about teaching. We got enough rah-rah, sis, boom preachers out there. Amen. You know? Mm, we need teachers. Yeshua was a teacher. He's a rabbi. We need teachers. We need teachers. Yes. Parents are supposed to be teachers. They're supposed to teach their children. Teach your children when they lay down, when they rise up, when they sit up. Teachers, 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 teachers. Yeshua looked out. And saw the sheep without a shepherd, and he began to sit down and teach them. And he shewed up to the Mount of Olives, and he taught them. The next day after Sukkot, he sat down, and he taught them. Yeshua taught this parable and taught this parable. We need some teachers who know what the heck they're teaching. But they will gather themselves teachers. They will look for people. And round up teachers who say whatever their ears want to hear. Oh, I don't like him. Listen, I'm not, a, I'm not trying to win a popularity contest. I might never see you till the big bash. You're not taking care of my family. I'm not taking care of yours per se. But it is my job to teach the Word of God unadulterated, undiluted. That is my job. Little babies like to get their Ears tickled. Tickle their ears, little babies. Give them a little milk. Give them a little milk. Ooh, coo, coo. We said something cute. We told them how to help out their marriage. Ooh, it's so cute. I feel so empowered now. We're probably not going to have a fight for at least two days. It's ridiculous. Look what's going on in the world. Your shoe is at the door, and we're teaching people how to be good employees. Yes, they will stop listening to the truth. But will turn aside to follow myths. The apostle foresees a time when people show a positive distaste for solid teaching. I'm not saying we have solid teaching here. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you better find out where it is. If it's here, good. If it's not, go where it is. They will willfully turn away from those who teach the truth of God's word. Willfully. Their ears will itch for doctrines that are pleasing and comfortable. Look at our society, our shoes, our beds. We have, we have massage chairs in our car. How, how, how did you like that hotel? Oh, it, it's, it's not my memory foam at home. It's not my 12th hour. You were in a hotel. Try living in the street. So we want to be comfortable in life. We want comfortable teaching from God. Don't make me upset. Rabbi, I want to leave here feeling great. To satisfy their lust, they will lust for gratifying doctrine. They will accumulate groups of teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. They will lust for inoffensive preaching. Lust to not be offended. And they'll sacrifice truth for fables. Deception, it is here and it's going to come on stronger and stronger and stronger. And if you don't know what's real, then you're going to fall prey to the counterfeit. I'm telling you as my friends, I'm telling you, it's my brothers in Yeshua. Number two, 
Wars, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes, 24, 6, 7. Yeshua goes on to the next item. First, he starts with deception, the most important. We'll, we'll rifle through these, I promise. You will hear the noise of wars nearby and the news of wars far off. See to it that you don't become frightened. It's frightening, right? I mean, you know, people are like, nah, I'm not frightened. Oh, yeah? If it happened here, you would be. 2,000 Israel equals 40,000 here. What would have happened if Canada would have shot 5,000 rockets into Detroit and cut off the heads of, let's see, it would be how many times? 10 times. Cut off the heads of 400 infants, babies in front of their mother, and then burn their mothers in their houses. You don't think you'd be a little concerned being in America? Sure. And you think it's staying there? You think we're not going to be the home team at some point? Then what Bible are you reading? I'm sorry. I'm just wondering. What are you reading? I'm not making this up. I'm not here to scare you. I'm not scared. I'm not trying to scare you. I promise we'll end on a good note. I promise. Hang on. I promise we will. You'll come out of here being empowered. You'll know some more stuff. And you'll be ready to take on hell with a water pistol. How's that? Such things must happen. Such things must happen. Such things must... I know we want to kind of skip over this. Yeshua, can't we just skip over the tribulation? Can't we just skip over what's bad? Can I get my degree and just skip over studying? No. It has to happen. These things must happen, so says Yeshua. But the end is yet to come, meaning it's not the end. It's contractions, man contractions for peoples will fight each other nations will fight each other there'll be famines earthquakes in various parts of the world a lot of scriptures say pestilence okay Yeshua said prior to his return he said peoples will fight each other and nations will fight each other those are two different things I don't want to get technical but he said it if he would have just said well nations are going to fight each other then we're talking about international wars wars between nations but he didn't say that I'm just, I just want to, I got to use the right word. Um, I don't want to say educate. That's condescending. Um, I just want you to understand something. He predicted that peoples will fight each other. Those are ethnos wars. They're not wars between nations, but they're tribal wars or intrastate wars. Intrastate wars are wars among two groups of people within a recognized territory of the state. Okay. They include civil wars or intercommunal conflicts. Let me give you just a brief rundown of what I know that's going on in the world. The Myanmar conflict has been going on since 1948, Myanmar. The Colombian conflict since 1964. The Angolan conflict since 1975. The Somali civil war since 1978. Afghanistan conflict since 1978. The Senegal conflict since 1982. The Congo insurgency since 1996. The Iraq conflict since 2003. The Pakistan war since 2004. Sudan nomadic conflict since 2008. Syria civil war since 2011, the Mali war since 2012, jihadist insurgency in Burkina since 2015, jihadist insurgency in Nigeria since 2016, the Central African Republic civil war since 2012, the Yemen civil war since 2014, the Cameroon civil war since 2017, the insurgency in Mozambique since 2017, the Ethiopian civil conflict, which by the way is going on right now, we just sent a bunch of money to them because you've got the Amharic guerrillas fighting the government since 2018. And to add to this, there's been 50 international conflicts since World War II. Now, you probably knew about almost none of them because we're in a bubble. It's America. I love America. You have no idea. My dad, you know, he had shrapnel all over his arm. He was a marksman. He was a Purple Heart, Bronze Star for bravery. I love America. But America is in a bubble and American Christians are in the bubble of bubbles the book of Revelation tells us that conflicts and terrible wars will escalate until the whole world is involved the whole world it'll be World War three it is estimated that 50% listen I'm giving you statistics 50% of all research scientists in the world now are involved in one thing arms development 
50% of all research scientists in the world are doing one thing, developing warfare and arms of warfare and weapons of mass destruction. There is at least one military weapon and 4,000 pounds of explosive for every man, woman, and child on earth. Listen, Iran, you know, they're not, they're not goat herders anymore. They've got all the warfare you can imagine. And, and the drones that drop bombs in Israel, they don't have that technology. You know the only person that has bomb-dropping drones? It's Russia. You don't think they're involved? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mean that. Was, that was not nice. That was mockery. Forgive me. But it's like, listen, guys, I like to go to the beach, but get your head out of the sand. I'm not here to scare you. I know some people are like, wow, this is scary, Rabbi. Tell me something good. I am telling you something good. After this is really good. According to Statista, which keeps statistics on warfare and weapons, the best in the world, in 2019, global military expenditures grew to $1.9 trillion in the U.S. alone. Almost $2 trillion we spent just on warfare. We're not sleeping either. Just some of our peeps are. Yeshua also warned that prior to his return, there would be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. Famines. According to the World Health Organization, one-third of the world's population goes to bed hungry. One-third of the world's population goes to bed starving, which means two-thirds of the world's population don't have enough food. Do you know in America right now, there's about a 15, 15% of the people can't put three good meals on the table? That might not be you, but that's America. I personally have been to places where I watch people starving to death in the street. I am not making it up. Starving to death right in front of me. Pestilences, COVID-19 has raised global awareness of our vulnerability to new and unusual disease. The World Health Organization puts out a report called the Disease Outbreak News, and it reports all the outbreaks that are around the world. Yellow fever is at an all-time high. Dungy virus, Nympha virus, what's called the plague, meningitis, and many others. In fact, to make matters worse, there are now superbugs that are totally resistant to antibiotics. Said there'd be earthquakes. You ever tell somebody, it seems like earthquakes on the rise, and they go, ah, there's always been earthquakes. Were you that person? Ah, there's always been. Can you get some statistics before you go, ah, where are you getting that from? My hand. See? <laughs> it's my statistic hand. Incorporated Research Institution of Seismology reports that between 1900 and 1969, yes, they've been keeping records since 1900, there were roughly six major earthquakes every 10 years. Six major earthquakes every 10 years, 69. After 69, our recent data indicates that major earthquakes now occur once a month. In fact, they're doubling every 10 years. So see, that this doesn't work. It doesn't work with me. But you need to know this. If somebody goes like this, you go, go talk to Rabbi Greg. <laughs> Rabbi, somebody just went like this to me. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Go like this back. That's what you got, right? Nah. <laughs> ah, Earth Crusade's been around. No, they're doubling every 10 years. <laughs> so, so pretty much we see that this is really taking place, the things he warned, the signs. He didn't say that he would come back right at that moment. He said they would be birth pains, but this is happening. Yes. You know, it's happening, right? You can, and you just can't say, well, my spirit, I feel. Come on, yeah. Nice stat. <laughs> well, I feel in the spirit. You sure that wasn't from the pepperoni pizza you ate at midnight before you went to bed? <laughs> I'm just saying, we got stats. We got figures, man. We got scripture. We got the inerrant word of God. Come on, bring me something. What about the rise in anti-Christian sentiment and persecution? He said this. Then that's what he went on next. I'm just giving you an order of things. He said at that time, when all these things, when these birth pangs are happening, you'll be arrested. Oh, we won't be arrested in America for our Christian faith. <laughs> oh, that's for, oh, that's for the Chinese. They get arrested for their faith. Because they don't speak English. <laughs> well, I got news for you. This is going to be a different party, so you better bring the soy sauce and some mugu gai pan because it's coming. <laughs> At that time, you'll be arrested and handed over to be punished 
and put to death, and all peoples will hate you because of me. Weren't the 12 disciples hated because of him? Yes. Weren't they put to death? Yes. Last time I checked, 64 million people have been put to death since the disciples split. In the last days, there will be an explosion of antagonism towards God's people. In America, we're seeing headlines about Christian business owners who are expected to set aside their beliefs in support of secular progressive ideals. Well, me and, me, me and my girlfriend are getting married, so I want you to bake a cake. I'm sorry. It goes against my beliefs. We're reporting you. It's happening. Guys, it's happening. Universities and school boards. Oh, boy, is this not a hotbed for morons. People of higher education. Man, PhDs, pile it higher and deeper. <laughs> Universities and school boards admit to routinely passing over Christian faculty members for promotion. I just read an article about they hired for schools to integrate all different races and ethnicities. They hired her in Silicon Valley to look over all the schools in Silicon Valley. They hired a black woman who was pro-Black Lives Matter, so they thought they got somebody. She starts saying, we got to do something about the Jewish people. They said, don't. No, no. No, no. She was fired. They picked the perfect person on paper because she wanted to incorporate some of the Jewish people into their oneness. And this is what they explained to her. I just want you to know their understanding on college campuses. There are two people in the world. There are oppressors and the oppressed. Get off it. The oppressed. We're oppressed. Get off the freak off it. The Jews came here with the clothes on their back. The Chinese people came here with the clothes on. You know what the Chinese people did? They went to school and they studied. And now it's Dr. Wong. <laughs> Study. Schools are free. Study. Put your nose to the grindstone. Get a degree. Get a job. The old-fashioned way. Hard work. Forget luck. You know what my theory on luck is? The harder I work, the luckier I get. You see the Jews say, well, they, night, they came over here after 48. Six million were killed, 1.5 million children under 10. You don't see them crying the blues. How'd they do it? They, the same way I did. I was raised in the projects. I was the minority. I went to free school. Free school? But it, it's not like that anymore. No. School's still free in America, man. You can go to college for free. Not my kids. Not my kids. I just wasn't rich enough to be able to not be hurt by it, and I wasn't poor enough to get a free ride. It sucks being the middle class. <laughs> Everywhere you look in America, the faith is under attack. But on a global scale, it's far worse, guys. During 2021, there's something called the Watch World Watch List. And they report in a publication called Open Doors. And they report crimes against God's people. More than 340 million Christians live under high levels of persecution. You hear that number? 4,761 Christians were martyred last year. 4,488 churches were attacked and burned. 4,277 believers were arrested and sentenced and imprisoned without a trial. Stats. These numbers are escalating at an alarming rate. Just a few months ago, do we have that picture, Roxanne? I'm sorry, my head's not working. That picture, I'll, I'll sh uh, maybe remind me afterwards. Just a few months ago, in Manipur, India, I sent Samuel there. He went there. He, they said, are you crazy? They're going to kill you. And he went with his wife and a bunch of our pastors. They went to Manipur. This is, just to let you know, we now have 27 new congregations in Sri Lanka. Sorry, I decided to adopt congregations in Sri Lanka as opposed to putting up a water slide. My bad. I'll work harder next week. Samuel went there. 300 churches. Guys, are you living under rock? Manipur, didn't you read about it? Didn't you hear about it? 300 churches were burned to the ground in northeast India. They killed 200 people. 70,000 people are displaced. They have nowhere to go. 
And if you baptize now in India and they catch you, you go to jail for three years. This is happening now. Rabbi, who are the two witnesses? Not you, obviously. You should be witnessing. Next, talk about violence and civil disobedience. He goes on to that. He says, many people's love will grow cold because of increased lawlessness. Let's get rid of law enforcement. Who's the genius that came up with that? Listen, when somebody breaks in your house, you, you, you should call 911, I think. When you're in an accident, call a doctor. Don't call a lawyer. Lawyer's not going to help you. We got this all wrong, guys. Yeshua said, I don't care if you're black, white. I don't care if you're Jew or Gentile. I don't care if you're Hispanic, Asian. I don't care if you're rich or poor. I don't give a hoot. I care about what God says. And if you're a believer, then you should care what God says. And stop getting in your own philosophies, your own ideology. Well, what I think, who cares? Nobody cares. Only the other idiots on TikTok care. <laughs> There's a bomb that's about to go off, and that's the only TikTok you should be listening to. Because it keeps ticking and talking. Many people's love will grow cold because of increased lawlessness. Lawlessness, anomia in the Greek, where we get the word anemia. Anemia is a lack of blood cells, red blood cells, so you're weak. Anomia is a lack of spiritual blood cells, so spiritually you're weak. Lawlessness would take over. Yeshua said there'd be an increase. In the last days, he said wickedness will be rampaging. Human affections will be less and less evident. It's so sad, but as the days draw to a close, acts of unlove will be commonplace. God's law will be, is the way to preserve selflessness. The world says, what's in it for me? Selfishness is the basis of all human misery. If you're far away from God's laws, then chances are you're far away from God. Romans tells us that we want slaves to lawlessness. John tells us that sin is lawlessness. Thessalonians calls the Antichrist the man of lawlessness. And Yeshua himself says at the end of his one and only sermon, I never knew you, you worker of lawlessness. I go to a store now, it's, it's unbelievable. I walk in, hi, how you doing? And they look at me like, I'm like, you should have said that. And then they go, what do you need? What do I need? You to be decent? That's what I need. Decency. I'm not talking about anything... Don't roll out the red carpet. Those days are gone. The customer always being right, history. Only old people understand that. Now it's like, what do you need? Or due to high call volume, bull crap. Due to the fact that you don't want to hire a human being because it cuts into your profits. That's what you should say. Be honest. It's ridiculous. Customer service is an oxymoron. I can't deal with it. Some of you young people, oh, it's fine. I just order it on the online. I'll just put it on the line. I'm good with online. I don't want to talk to anybody anyway. I'm too busy making TikTok videos. Me and my sister dancing like morons. We got 300,000 views watching us do this. Shake off the Skittles. Shake off the Skittles. So that's basically what Yeshua said prior to him coming. These are going to be the things that are going to birth the tribulation, the seven years. And he comes, obviously, towards the end. He comes towards the end to a clean house. The other things I see that I just want to throw at you quickly, a general moral decay in the world. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 4. It says, moreover, understand this, in the acharit hayamim, in the last days, will come trying times. He warned us it's going to be difficult. People will be self-loving, money-loving, proud, arrogant, insulting, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, uncontrolled, brutal, hateful of good, traitorous, headstrong, swollen with conceit, loving pleasure rather than the God. He said that 2,000 years ago. He gives a description of the conditions that will exist in the world prior to the Lord's coming. 
people will be self-centered, conceited, and egotistical. Does that sound about right? The exact opposite of how we're supposed to conduct ourselves in abject humility. They will be greedy and love is a money. It will never be enough. Never be enough. Five stores, ten stores, but I can make more. I can make more. I could be something. They'll be profane, abusive, and insulting. They'll be rebellious and disobedient towards their own parents. They'll be ungrateful. They'll be unthankful, and they will be lacking appreciation. Everything's coming to them. They'll be irreverent and holding nothing sacred. They'll be hard-hearted, callous, and unfeeling. They'll be unforgiving and refusing to make peace. They'll be slanderers, spreading false and malicious reports. Men with uncontrolled passion, brutal, savage, and unprincipled. Haters of whatever is good. Then, sadly enough, there's the general spiritual decay in the church. The next verse, he says, and they retain the outer form of religion but deny its power. Stay away from these people. It will be a new form of paganism operating under the name of Christianity. They want to be religious and have their sins at the same time. They maintain a form of religion, but there is no legitimate force in their life. Basic fundamentals of the faith will fall by the wayside. Instead of shepherds leading the sheep into a deep and committed relationship with the Lord, we will have gifted motivational speakers entertaining the goats. Revelation 3.17 For you keep saying I am rich. I have gotten rich. I don't need a thing. You don't know that you are the one who is wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Don't be fooled. The complacency and materialism we see today in the body of Messiah, the characteristics of the lukewarm Laodicean church. This is the same church that Jesus said he would spew out of his mouth. The church of Laodicea was the victim of self-deception concerning their spiritual condition. This lukewarm church had convinced itself that everything was all right. The church was characterized by pride, ignorance, self-sufficiency, and complacency. Pride, we got this. Ignorance, whatever. Self-sufficiency, we're good. Complacency, it's all good. The church of Laodicea was caught in a trap. Tolerance, relativism, apathy, and political correctness. Some of you I know are conspiracy nuts. Some of you are just nuts. I don't get caught up in that crap. If the government wants to watch me in the shower, have fun. Who cares? But... But look at what Revelation 13, 16, 17 says. Also, it forces everyone, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead, preventing anyone from buying or selling, unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Listen, you see we're moving to a cashless society, right? Right now in America, we're 50% cashless. 50% of people don't use cash. In Europe, they had all different currencies. Now they only have one. Crypto is coming on the scene. You've got to have a one-world government. You got it in order to buy and sell. You can't be going in and having foreign exchange when you're trying to buy some food. So there has to be one denomination of some kind of currency. And the easiest way is something, not a card. You can lose a card. And why are we prone to this? We're prone to this because there are conditions that foster a cashless society. Abductions. Everybody's afraid that their kids are going to be abducted. You know, we have child slavery and and millions of kids in America that are abducted every year. Identity theft. We're totally scared that one day we're going to look at our account. That's why we look at it every day. Oh, oh, there's still three million in it. Oh, good, good. I got worried. I got to go out and buy tires this week. Fraud. Theft protection. The global economy, technology, and good old fear. October 13, 2004, the FDA approved the implantable computer chip, radio frequency identification, you know this, RFID. It's a technology that uses radio waves to uniquely identify people. The research is not new, though. In October 1948, 48, a paper was written by Henry Stockman called Communication by Means of Reflected Power Exploring RFID. In fact, RFID human implants have not only been conducted by a British professor of cybernetics called Kenning Warnick, but he himself has implanted the chip in his hand in 1998. Rabbi, what's the take-home message? Don't take the chip. Or take the chip and take the mark, and I'll never see you again. What can I tell you? Well, what if we get out of here before? Then you don't have to worry about it. What if we don't? I told you, when it comes to the rapture, the rapture is legit. 
okay? You can't deny that something's going to happen. But are we going to be gathered and hidden like the Jews were hidden in Goshen? Are we going to go up? It's, it's a little obscure. What I'm saying is we don't know the exact timing of it during the tribulation. We don't know. And the fact of the matter is some of you are going through tribulation right now. Your own tribulation. Revelation 1-7. It says, look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him. This was written 2,000 years ago. How is every eye going to see him? Advanced technology, a.k.a. satellite distribution. Arthur C. Clarke was the first person to popularize the idea using satellites as a means of broadcasting all over the world. Wireless world, he wrote, in the late 1940s. Isn't it interesting that a lot of these things, the credit card and the chip and, and satellite technology, all 1948 when Israel became a state? Coincidence? Maybe not. Maybe not. Then it took off in the 1950s when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, and that was the beginning of satellite communication. Of course, we can't leave out the rebirth of Israel worldwide aliyah. Luke 21, 29, 31. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree. Indeed, all the trees. All the trees. It wasn't just the fig tree. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things taking place, you ought to know that the kingdom of God is near. That's the parallel. Luke 21 is parallel to Matthew 24. Same thing when they ask them the same question, when are you coming back? The fig tree Israel was rebirthed in 1948. For the first time in centuries, the Jewish people have a national existence in their homeland. This means that the kingdom of God is near. We didn't know. They wanted it to happen in 48. The prophecies were there in Ezekiel, Jeremiah. We went over them last week. 48. How about 148? How about 1048? We didn't know it was going to take this long. But again, a thousand years is like a day. To, to the Lord, it was two days. You guys are complaining. It took me two days to do it. He's on an eternal scale. He doesn't use a clock and a watch like we do. Yeshua also predicts, though, that not only the fig tree, Israel, it's always a metaphor for Israel, all throughout the Bible, would shoot forth his trees, but he says all the trees. See that? Yes. What is he talking about? All the nations. We have recently witnessed the demise of colonial governments and the proliferation of new nations. In fact, I can give you another stat. In 1900, there were just 78 independent nations. Today, there's 196. That's huge in a short time. Huge. By the way, the Jewish agency also keeps Aliyah statistics. Do you realize what's going on? There are approximately 13.3 million Jews in the world today. 13.3, there's 8 billion people. That means 99.95% of the world's population is non-Jewish. Can you imagine? The country is 7,900 square miles and all eyes are on her. The whole world. Everybody's involved. Every nation is watching Israel. Didn't he say, I'm going to put a center stage. Look at a map. Look at what's center. Israel. Didn't he say there's going to be worldwide contention? You try to lift it or divide it. Watch right. He's putting her on display. And he's going to do his magic. Over 95% of all Jewish people are either in Israel or in the USA. This is remarkable. 95% of the people in 1948 were outside of Israel. This is remarkable. In 1948, there were 150,000 Iraqi Jews. Today, zip. Sudan, zip. Algeria, zip. Where are they all? They're either in Israel or in the United States of America. Jewish people are hesitant to leave America. You, you can't blame them, right? Look at how we live. Israel's horrible. People go there and they go, oh, I'd love to live here. I know. The other same people that went on spring break in Florida said, I'd love to live here. So you ended up being a chambermaid in the hotels for $7 an hour. One third of the country is living below the poverty line. There's no country clubs. There's no land. Some of you have 25 acres. You can't get an acre over there. You can't get a half an acre. Nothing. Nothing. It's rough, man, and everybody hates you. So the American Jews don't want to leave. American Jews, man, they live in the suburbs. They have nice homes. Their kids go to good schools. They belong to a country club. A country club. They don't want to leave. They, they were supposed to come back from Persia, right? That's the, that's the story, right? They were supposed to come back, but they didn't come back. 
That's where we get that whole story of Purim. It was 483. They were supposed to come back before that. 537, the Babylonian exile was up. Why'd they stay? Why are they going to go back to Israel? All these patterns are the same. Hamas is fighting Israel. Who's Hamas? The, the Philistines were fighting Israel. The same place in the Gaza Strip. They're all the same. Nothing's new under the sun. So how are we going to get the Jewish people out of here? God promises they got to go. Yes. Greg Hersberg, you got to go. Your kids got to go. How is he going to get me out of here? Two ways. Persecution. Well, I'll tell you how he's going to get me out of here. He's just got to tell me. My bag's packed. That's how he's going to get me out. He tells me to go, I go. But how is he going to get the other Jewish people that don't know Yeshua and aren't attuned to the Holy Spirit? He's got to kick them out. And the only way you're going to kick them out is you hit him in the pocketbook. So the economy's got to take a hit. Rabbi, don't say that. My stocks are doing so well. You selfish. <laughs> you're unbelievable. Lord, destroy the economy so the Jews can go back to the land, so that all the nations can surround and fight, so that Jesus can come back. Just don't hurt my portfolio. Just mine. What's wrong with you? You're a Christian. So he's got to, and what, how else he's going to do it? Rise in anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is up 38% this year alone. They're putting swastikas on Jewish clubs at the University of Georgia. You don't read about that, right? Now CNN ain't going to report that. God wants none to perish, so he will get them home. Sadly enough, economic crash and anti-Semitism is coming. Rabbi, this is probably the most depressed message you've ever given. Look, tomorrow there's plenty of places you can go to get a motivational speech. What do you want from me? And last but not least, I'm sorry, it's taken a, a while. I would have done this in two weeks, but next week I'm not going to be here. Last but not least, the focus to rebuild the temple. Zechariah 6.15, listen, those who are now far away will come and help rebuild the temple. I read an article by Ezra Halevi in the Israeli National News that on the last day of Sukkot, October 7, 2007, a delegation from West Poplar, that's the furthest place from Israel. This bunch of Christians, there was like 34 of them in West Poplar, where they have so much gold, they read that scripture and they go, he's talking to us. And they dug up a bunch of gold, went to Jerusalem on the last day of Sukkot, knocked on the door of the third temple, and, and handed it to them. And said, we're the ones, we're fulfilling Zechariah 6.15. Can you imagine? A bunch of uneducated, untaught people read a scripture and run over there, and we're like, they ain't getting none of my gold. Mm -mm. My gold is my gold. So, obviously I wanted to authenticate this, so I called a friend of mine at the time, Yehuda Glick, a rabbi, came over to our house, we visited him. He was the head of the Third Temple Network. So I called him. I said, hey, it's Greg Hirschberg, Yehuda. What's going on? Is this true? This is what he said to me. I'll never forget it. I wrote it down. Quote, he and his words are becoming reality right in front of our eyes. And he doesn't know Yeshua. The Orthodox Jews want him, Yeshua, back, want the Messiah back. They don't know it's him, but they want the Messiah back more than most Christians do. Said, these are the things that must be fulfilled. We're almost home. Burn, where are we with time? Okay. Daniel 9, this is, I'm just going to give you a, a smit, a, just a, a smidge of the timing. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and for your holy city, for putting an end to the transgression, for making an end to sin, for forgiving iniquity, for bringing in everlasting justice, for setting the seal. I can't go over each one, but basically... It's bringing Messiah back. That's what's going to happen. Putting an end to transgression when Messiah comes back. An end to sin when Messiah comes back. Forgiving iniquity. He's talking to Israel. Daniel was talking to Israel. And for anointing the especially holy place. The only time the holy place is going to be anointed is when the anointed one steps in and takes the throne. Know therefore and discern that 70 weeks of years, we know it has to be years because the word week, Shabbat, is years, will elapse between the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until an anointed prince comes. It will remain built. This looks very technical. I'm going to break it down and make it so simple. Don't let your head spin. I just have to read this and I'll break it down. 62 weeks of years with open space and moats, but these will be troubled times. Continue. Then after the 62 weeks, Mashiach will be cut off and have nothing. Daniel is predicting, Daniel's prediction about when Messiah would come and when he would die was so accurate that I call the book of Daniel, not Daniel in the lion's den, but Daniel in the critic's den. 
Every critic and antagonist of faith says he couldn't have wrote this before it happened. It's impossible. How's that? He's criticized up and down. There's no way he could have wrote this when he said he wrote this. The people of the prince yet to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, but his end will come with a flood and desolations are decreed until the war is over. Talking about the tribulation. He'll make a strong covenant with leaders for one week of years, seven years. For half of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and the grain offering. On the wing of the detestable things of the desolator will come and continue until the already decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. That's the Antichrist. Now, look at, let me explain something to you. The historical fulfillment of the first prophecy shows that the weeks are weeks of years. So he, basically we have 70 weeks of years. 70 weeks of 70 years is 490 years. So far so good? He's talking about a time of 490 years. The 70 weeks are divided into 7 weeks plus 62. So the first seven sevens, that's 49 years. From the decree, the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem was in 445. Okay? In Nehemiah 2122, you can look that up. That's the decree. So 445 to 396, it, that's how long it took to restore Jerusalem. That's exactly 49 years. So, so far, dead on. Right? Then he says there's a 70th week with a prince yet to come. The prince, probably the revised Roman Empire, but the Antichrist. He's going to be the Antichrist, the Anti-Messiah, and he's going to make a non-aggressive alliance. If you do the math, this is crazy. If you do the math of 69 years, 7 plus 62, 69 years, and you come up with 173,880 days, if you factor in leap years and no zero year, you get 33 AD when Messiah was going to be cut off. Is that nuts? And then he says, sometime in the future, there's this gap from the time Messiah is killed. There's a gap, seven years, sometime in the future. What have I been looking for? Not earthquakes, not pestilence. I'm looking for a war and a false peace treaty. That's what I've been looking for from the day I read that. There has to be a false peace treaty. This Antichrist is going to have so much charisma, he's going to be able to sit down with the Arab nations, sit down with Israel, sit down with America and create a treaty. And he's going to look like a Messiah. He's going to look like a deliverer. He's going to look like a great guy. And he's going to deceive the masses. And then halfway in, three and a half years, exactly what they say, a times, times, and a half a time. Times, one year. Times, two years, a half a time, three and a half years. That's Hebrew reckoning. He's going to stand up, put in an abomination of desolation, and call himself the Messiah, where there's nothing more abominable than that in the temple. And he's going to make it real hard on the Jews. And that's called the time of Jacob's great troubles. I know I threw a lot at you, but it's not that complicated. We're looking at seven years, and a peace treaty has to kick off that seven years. A peace treaty has to kick off that seven years. Now, here's the good news for us. I told you, I promise I'll leave you on a good note, right? There's a really bad earthquake coming today to make it. No, that's not the... <laughs> it could use one, but that's beside the point. Here's the good news for us. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Wait for his son Yeshua, whom he raised from the dead, to appear from heaven and rescue us from the impending fury of God's judgment. Thessalonians, the other little letter that gets very eschatological. Paul was there for three weeks, and these people thought they were going through the tribulation. And Paul had to explain to them, no, you're not. You're not. Because they were wondering, like, why are we still here? How come we didn't take off? He was explaining to them. But what he did encourage them with, and it was encouragement, because in the first century, all Christians, all believers, all people who believed in Yeshua were persecuted. It wasn't a matter of if, it was when and how bad. Their property was taken away, they couldn't hold a job, they were starving, they were put in prison and martyred. That happened in the first century. Read the book of Hebrews. It was just across the board. That's the way it was. So he comes in there in this very persecuted, you know, congregation, this fellowship, and he writes them this letter. And he's encouraging them in the midst of their persecution. He's saying, you're not going to go through God's wrath. We are not going to go through God's wrath. Do you understand that? We will not go through God's wrath. We pass over. The only judgment we have is the judgment seat of Christ, which means we sit and he's going to go over. Not the judgment of our salvation or our eternity. That's in stone. The judgment of what did you do with all I gave you? Did you create silver, gold, and bronze? Or was it hay, stubble, and grass? 
What did you do? But we pass over judgment. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God has not intended that we should experience his fury, but that we should gain deliverance through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Again, believers are not destined for God's wrath. Now, God's wrath is orge. That's the word used throughout. Tribulation is philispus. But sometimes in the Bible they're using tribulation not for the tribulation. You follow? They use tribulation 24 times for troubles. Tribulation means pressure. Guys, if any of you are serious believers, you don't feel the pressure? You don't feel the pressure? Because God is pressing. He's, he's, he's almost had it. We're his children. He loves us, but he has to wait for a time. But in the meantime, his heart is breaking. And he sees, so he's pressing. And Satan feels the heat. So you know what Satan's doing? He feels the heat. He knows his time is short. He knows. He was the highest angel. He knows. You follow? So he's feeling the pressure. He's like, I got to alleviate this pressure. I'm going to press them. I'm going to press their marriages. I'm going to press their finances. I'm going to press their faith. I'm going to press things that they believe. I'm going to antagonize them. I'm going to turn sword on sword, Christian against Christian, denomination against denomination. I'm going to cause so much division and dissension and hatred among the body of believers. They're just going to throw in the towel. Oppression, affliction, and distress. Last but not least, here's the warning. Matthew 25. Remember, 24, 25, there's no, there's no chapters. 24, he gives the signs of the end of the age, and then he gives warnings. He talks about these foolish virgins. They had no oil. You know why? They made a profession. No real faith. They had faith without works. It wasn't legit. No oil. And when he comes, there's nowhere to buy oil. You can't have mine. My oil is my oil. You can't siphon my oil out into your tank. It's not going to work. Foolish virgins. They look like virgins, but they didn't conduct themselves and so. It says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you whom my father has blessed. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you from the founding of the world. For I was hungry. Jesus is saying this to his disciples. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You made me a guest. Yes. I needed clothes. You provided them. I was sick. You took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. So the application, the application, not the interpretation, which most people teach. The application is clear. The neediest people are the poor, the world, and the orphan, the stranger, the sick, those in prison. The interpretation is different. Look at the next couple of verses. Then the people who have done what God wants will reply, Lord. When, I mean, he, you know, Jesus wasn't hungry. I mean, he had no place to lay his head out of choice because he was on a mission. He had plenty of places to stay. Lord, when did we see you hungry? They're, they're asking. And feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink. When did we see you a stranger and make you our guest? Or needing clothes and provide them? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will say to them, yes, I tell you that whenever you did these things for one of the least important of these brothers of mine, some of your versions say brethren, you did for me. Now, I don't think Satan wants you to, t to hear what I'm about to say. And if I'm wrong, an ear, let it out of the other ear. If I'm wrong and you walk away and you go, you study this a little bit, this parable, and you go, look, the guy means well, but he's, he's out of his mind. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Okay, but look at the definition of brothers of mine. There are two words that almost look identical. One is alde fates, the other one is alde fas. Two words in the Greek. The one used here is not alde fates. Me and you. Let's say me and you. You're a Gentile, I'm a Jew, you believe in Yeshua, I'm believing in Yeshua. We have an alde fates, we have a brotherhood. Every blood-bought Christian is my brother. They might not see me as their brother. I see them as my brother. I, I swear to you I do. But Yeshua isn't saying a fraternity of brotherhood. He's saying what you did for the least of these brothers of mine. Union in the womb, brothers by blood. He is saying that in the last days, the Jewish people are going to be hungry. It's going to be another Holocaust. They're going to be hungry. 
They're going to be thirsty. They're going to be imprisoned. And what you do for the least of these brothers of mine, then you do that for me. And what you don't do for the least of these brothers of mine, you didn't do that for me. Make sure you're a member of the church of Philadelphia, not a member of the church of Laodicea. Philadelphos, Philadelphos, lover of the Jewish people. Rabbi, this is crazy. What do the Jewish people have to do with me? Everything. They gave you monotheism, they gave you the Bible, and they gave you Jesus. And God is coming back to fight for them, and Jesus is crazy about them. They are brothers of his. If you love him, you love his brothers. Don't let anybody hoodwink you. I don't give a crap about supersessionism, replacement theology, or all these intellects in some of these denominations stroking their beard and doing nothing with their faith. Nobody ever replaced Israel. Israel's his wife. Nobody replaces Bernadette. You didn't replace her. You increased in size, but you didn't replace her. God hates divorce. That's his wife, man. And he's coming back to fight for her. How, if you're here during the first half, let's just say, and a Jew knocks on your door to be hidden, and you don't pull the Corey Ten Boom thing, you're like, no, if I, they find you, they'll kill me. Do you think if you do that, if, if Bernadette was in trouble, and I was away on a mission trip, and you didn't try to help her, you think I'd come back and say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. It's insidious, but that's how Satan works. It's insidious, that's how he's going to get people in these last days. That's how he's going to get people in these last days. Matthew 24, 37, 39. For the Son of Man coming with just as it was in the days of Noah. Noah, back then before the flood, people went on eating and drinking, taking wise meaning. It was business as usual. Right up till the day Noah entered the ark, and they didn't know what was happening until the flood came and swept them away. It would be just like that when the Son of Man comes. In the last days, most people will be indifferent, just as in the days of Noah. Although the days before the flood were terribly wicked, that is not the feature emphasized here. The people ate, they drank, they married, they gave in marriage. In other words, they went through the routines of life as if they were going to live forever. They were warned that a flood was coming, but they lived as though they were floodproof. When it came, they were unprepared, outside the only place of safety. Although God is loving and long-suffering, he's also righteous and just. God's mercy does not make judgment unavoidable. In other words, the rain must fall just like it did in the days of Noah. This is just the way it is and will be when Messiah returns. Only those who are in Messiah, a.k.a. the ark of safety, will be delivered. A couple more verses and we're out. 24, 40, 41. Then there will be two men in a field when he comes. There'll be two men in the field. Remember that? I never read it, but the, I'm sure some of you read that whole thing. Uh, what was it called? Left behind. Left behind. Left behind. 80 million copies. 80 million at about 10 bucks a profit a copy. 80, I never read it. You know why? I never read it because I thought it was ridiculous. Just tell people, just they're going to fly out. Nothing's going to happen. You're an American. You're going to just fly. No, nothing's going to happen. You're going to be fine. Then there'll be two men in the field. One will be taken and the other left behind. Hmm. I guess they didn't read this. There'll be two women grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken and the other will be left behind. I'm going to write a book. You want to be left behind. Because when he comes back, the one that's taken is taken to be eaten by the vultures. When Yeshua comes to reign, one will be swept away by the flood of God's judgment. The other one will be left to enter into the millennium. And enjoy the blessings of Messiah's reign. Listen, guys. Live with an ear for the trumpet and an eye for the clouds. And always be ready. Because when he comes, it's going to be glorious. Last but not least, Luke 21, 25, 27. You need to probably hear this again. Instead of tomorrow morning reading three hours about some mystery or some conspiracy... Read what Jesus said. Know what your Savior says. There will be appear signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on earth. Nation will be in anxiety and bewilderment at the sound and surge of the sea. As people faint with fear at the prospect of what is overtaking the world. For the powers in heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with tremendous power and glory. Isn't that amazing? 
doesn't that stir your soul? Does it, I, I know you might have plans tonight. You got some friends coming over. You're going to make some Korean barbecue. That's cool. I'm good with it. You know, tomorrow you're going to the mall with a friend. Go shop. Just like in the days of Noah. But man, this has to be soul stirring. Man, this has to be soul stirring. Don't you feel the pressure? I want the pressure alleviated. I want it alleviated. I want to be saved. I want to be delivered. I want my final exodus. Right before the second coming, Yeshua said there'll be disturbances involving the sun, moon, and the stars. Heavenly bodies will be moved out of orbit. The very earth is going to be tilted off its axis. There'll be great tidal waves sweeping across land areas. Panic will seize the hearts of men, but not for the godly. No way. Finally, we'll get to see this long-awaited Son of Man coming in a cloud of tremendous power. We'll see him. We'll see him. Last verse, and we're out. When these things start to happen, and they're starting, the contractions are starting. The baby's not ready to crown, but it's getting ready. The Son of Man is getting ready to be birthed in the earth. When these things start to happen, Beth Yeshua, when these things start to happen, Beth Yeshua, I'm talking to you. Stand up. Don't sit there. Stand up. Hold your heads high. Lift them high. Because you know what? We're about to be liberated. In these last days, don't you let liberal whatever crap they're spewing or the devil or any of his demons make you hang your head in embarrassment. You were bought with the precious blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. He didn't want to do that. He said, no, Lord, I don't want to do this. It's going to be horrible, horrific, but not my will. God said it pleased him to crush the son so he would see you so he would have you with him forever it pleased him to crush the son so he would be with you with all eternity that's how much you love don't you hang your head in embarrassment because he's coming to deliver us once and for all not once upon a time but once and for all so in these last days don't be anxious don't be fearful because the king is coming may he come speedily and in our days and let all God's people say amen Grab a hand, let me bless you so I can get out of here, please. Thank you. Might be my last one, you know? You don't know. This could be your last day. Go out swinging, man. Go out swinging. For the glory of God, go out swinging. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Prince of all Peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha Charanoi, Vayishmarecha. Yo Eranoi Ponovelecha, Vihunecha. Yisa Aranoi Ponovelecha, Vyasem Lecha. Shalom. I love you guys, I really do. Shabbat Shalom.